Welcome everyone to Master the World. We're so excited to have you guys here today. Uh, my name is Li Ming Stro. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Master the World. Today is our 10th webinar and amazingly the 12th kit, which means we have been shipping kits for one whole year. This is our anniversary kit. So uh, thank you to everyone who supported us from the very beginning. Uh, for those of you who supported us through Indiegogo as our crowdsourcing campaign, uh, I just want to say thank you so much to all of you uh, for being here. Resubscribe. We'd love to see you next month. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our panelists before I go through some of the things here. So from Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, we have Madeline Trafon. Old Michigan, but sunny. Thanks, Madeline. And we also have Tim Gazer from New Mexico. Hi, everybody. Uh, cloudy here, and it looks like it's going to snow pretty quick. Wow. And of course, my business partner, the amazing Evan Goldstein from San Francisco. Greetings, everybody here. And it is sunny with a chance of meatballs. <laughs> Very likely. And without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to Madeline. You're kicking us off on the wine, wine number one. You're on mute. I, sh I should unmute myself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a joy to be with you and uh, happy uh, to be starting this off. So cheers to everyone in whatever weather you are enjoying or enduring. Uh, wine number one. Uh, just to remind us all in looking at the uh, appearance, we don't overthink it, but we pay close attention because it can often be a tell a little bit later when we're trying to deduce. This is um, day bright and it's a true yellow color. You know, you could call it, um, you know, uh, I don't even think you can call it a straw color. It's a true yellow color, possibly a pale gold, no green glints in my glass. And as I swirl it, there's a little bit of weight. So hold that thought. Um, and uh, again, to remind us, we're assessing nose and palate together when we um, address the fruit citrus leads in a major way here. And to me, it's a sweet citrus. So uh, the aromatics and the flavor of this wine, but especially the aromatics are all about um, orange, Meyer lemon, tangerine. Uh, if I had to say grapefruit, I'd say pink for sure, fresh, perfectly ripe. Um, on the palate, a little bit of a sense of uh, peel or zest. You know, there's uh, a tactile character to the wine, a little bit of a bitterness. Tree vine fruit for me at this tasting today doesn't dominate. Um, I would say probably a little ripe um, a yellow or brown pear or yellow apple. Uh, again, fresh and ripe, but stone fruit is a major player, a major factor in this wine. And the whole Megillah both kinds of nectarines, um, apricots. I would actually add to this, sorry to be slightly creative grid, I'd add peach <laughs> because I think that, uh, you know, uh, take your pick between uh, apricot and peach, ripe and actually verging on dried. You know, it's, it's a wonderfully distinct aromatic. Tropical fruit, maybe a little bit of kiwi, um, floral, big time, again, so between the sweet citrus, the stone, uh, the stone fruit, and the flowers, take your pick in, in terms of which one's leading. It's like uh, uh, a trio singing. And uh, for me, it's very much uh, orange and uh, orange blossom and jasmine. Then moving on to uh, the next page. All right. Um, the green vegetables and other vegetables. Minor players, but you know, you can see cucumbers and salad greens are, you know, uh, mild uh, in terms of their aromatics and flavor. Um, other vegetable at this tasting, I would pick actually corn and ginger root because both of them have a little bit of an illusion, illusion of sweetness. Herbal, uh, I think the florality of lemongrass and the verbena come into play here for sure. And other spices, again, mirroring the, the illusion of sweetness of the corn and the ginger root, ginger powder, and a little bit of honey. But again, it's an illusion of sweetness. It's not a perceptible sweetness. Uh, I agree with the grid, no organic earth. Inorganic earth, it's especially aromatically, it's uh, so distinct. So again, there are actually four people singing in the room as opposed to three, because I think that um, uh, if you want a definition of what 
you know, wet rocks smell like, it's in this glass. And on the palate, uh, it comes through as uh, a saltiness that's distinct. Um, okay, Jing, oof, if there is any, it's fooling me, none at all. Oxidation nuttiness, again, a little bit on the sweeter side of an expression of nuts. So marzipan and pine nuts, no chemical compounds. For sure, Lee's contact, uh, you know, it comes through as not only as a flavor, but a, um, uh, and I think this is a, a young wine, uh, but also um, uh, that uh, richness on the mouthfeel, the feel of the wine. Um, and I will add to this, though it's not something we're grinning, this wine has terrific length, which to me, all things being equal, and if they're positive, is a mark of quality. It actually swells after I uh, swallow it or spit it out. Um, and I did taste it uh, about an hour ago, and I retasted it right before I said hello to you. Uh, in terms of structural elements, residual sugar, dry. Uh, acidity, Medium plus, I wouldn't say high at this tasting. You know, it is not deficient by anybody's measure, but it's not poignant or compelling. Alcohol, I would say moderate plus actually. You know, moderate to me is almost indistinguishable. You know, I feel it, but it's, um, um, it's a happy thought. It, it's not pulling my attention. Uh, phenols, they're present but low. Texture, Lean and tart by default, as opposed to, you know, rich and creamy, but, um, you know, there is a measure of creaminess to the wine, uh, thanks to the least contact and the ripeness of the fruit. Finish, long. And complexity, moderate plus. I mean, what's interesting to me about this wine that's actually really beautiful about it is that its complexity is distinct. You don't have to fight for this wine. You know, if you're paying close attention and you're controlling your nerves, not easy to do in a, a blind situation, the wine is speaking clearly. At least it is to me sitting here right now. Gentlemen, you want to add anything in terms of uh, perception or did I cover the subject nicely? No, awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Wonderful job. Um, so we're going to launch the poll. And for those of you who are sharing this with us the first time, you may already know what this wine is. And I think what Madeline just took you through is um, the thinking through what we're tasting. For those of you without the wine, those were your clues to guess which grape variety this is. And be true to yourself. If you know the answer, but man, you were going down this other path, you know, make sure that you click uh, and check that box as to what you think it is. Um, we have the questions on which grape variety and we, which region. Um, and so, you know, Madeline, I just ask you this while people fill out the poll for the first time. What tips do you have for somebody who's here for the first time? Uh, first of all, you know, you had a lot of options in terms of filling out the grid. Don't let that rock your boat. You know, if you only perceive one or two in each category, no problem. Me too, <laughs> quite often. I'm a simple taster. Uh, secondly, you know, in terms of concluding, one look at the labels worth a lot of money. <laughs> so the reason we have this poll up here, if you happen not to get it right, this doesn't mean, uh, I mean this quite sincerely, that you're a failure at this at all. This is, you know, deductive tasting. And we're going to, after each wine, talk about why it is what it is based on what we perceived and defined. Yeah, and I, I'm also um, want to encourage folks to not worry too much when you're answering the poll. I see a lot of hesitation, a lot of thinking. Just go for your first thought, go with your instinct. Um, I have two questions, Madeline. The first question for you to think a little bit about is uh, describing the phenols from Tony Harris. What are the phenols that you're tasting? And just hold that thought. And for Charmaine, who's asking if there was a grit in your box, no, there is no grit in your box. If you go online or can do it on your phone and just type type in mtwwines.com, you should be able to pull up our website and start tasting. There's a start tasting button, and that's where you will type in what this, um, this grid, this uh, box is, which is 114A, and the grid will present itself there. And again, you have three ways of tasting along if you want to do the full workout or if you want to just guess along. So I'm going to end. Say, I'm going to interrupt just for a moment. If they're finishing up the poll, have they finished the poll already? Yes, I I'm, I'm, yeah, go for it. I'm going to say, look at the grape varieties you're given. Don't overthink it. You have a highly aromatic grape variety, Sauvignon Blanc. You have an, a grape variety that's 
you know, moderately low in aromatics, the Semillon, and you have what I would call a semi-aromatic grape variety, Albariño, otherwise known as Albariño. So sometimes it's quite that simple. And here we are. Albariño, same grape variety as Albariño. It is young, it is a 2019, and it is uh, from Portugal, Northern Portugal specifically. But I will um, address uh, the Sauvignon Blanc Semillon issue right up front, since people, uh, that's, that's foremost in people's minds. Why not Sauvignon Blanc? I would say certainly a strong citrus element in um, varietally expressive Sauvignon Blanc, be it from the New World or the Old. But um, I think there would have it would have been um, less sweet toned, you know, less tangerine, Meyer lemon, pink grapefruit, and um, a little bit more um, green in uh, the herbal expression, more green elements. Um, also, Semillon, you know, would have had a different texture, almost waxy. And in terms of the aromatics, it would have been um, a little bit more subdued. This was very, very forward, you know, really singing in the glass aromatically. Um, in terms of the grape variety, uh, this is a grape variety and I talked about it, not because I was leading you, but I, I was telling the truth. You know, Alvarino is a semi-aromatic uh, grape variety classically, though I would say this one was highly aromatic, this particular wine. Uh, and a combination of flowers, both fresh, so sometimes dried, stone fruit for sure, peach, apricot, nectarine, and that sweet citrus element, and also uh, a minerality and specifically a salinity, because we're talking about a growing region, in this case, northern Portugal, um, that's right up against uh, the Atlantic. So we have uh, an almost equal spread, spread between Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon and 50% of the folks going for Albariño, Albariño. Um, you know, if you had given to me this to me blind, I would have automatically pivoted to, you know, Spain <laughs> for Albariño because I simply haven't tasted that much from Northern Portugal. And Evan can speak to this momentarily if you want to, Evan, but this is a grape variety that sings in the Mino Valley, uh, actually uh, in an area that, um, uh, is where vino, vino ver, uh, let me say, not vino, vino verde production. Did I say it correctly, Evan, who speaks vino Portuguese fluently? Yeah. Yeah, not absolutely. vino verde, right. Well, it would be that way if you were in Brazil. They would pronounce the H much more like a Y. Oh, well, that's good to know. There you go. Um, this is a wonderful producer that's tucked right up uh, against the border with uh, Spain. It is, uh, you know, um, a stone's throw from uh, from Spain. Um, this, this is from two growing regions and you're gonna to have to pronounce them for me, uh, Evan. There are two sub-districts within this area. That would be Monsal and Melgasu. Thank you very much. Very <laughs> In my next life, I'm going to be able to um, uh, pronounce Portuguese correctly. And it's, I think, a terrific expression of the variety. I will say that if you're struggling with, um, with, well, so much florality, right? Why not Riesling? Um, because sometimes people in blind tastings will smell that uh, floral expression and go, oh, yay, it must be Riesling. Well, but look to the alcohol level and look to the uh, acidity level, right? The alcohol would have been um, a little lower, I think, and the acidity would have been absolutely poignant. Um, and uh, somebody asked the question about the phenols. Think of phenols as um, white wine tannin, if you will, in terms of how it changes the texture of your mouth. It's a little bit of bitterness, but almost a little bit of a drying out character. And this is a grape variety that has thicker skins, which helps it um, you know, withstand the maritime climate um, where it's located, a pretty rainy area. Um, and also, you know, if there's skin contact evol involved, you're going to get a little bit of that phenolic uh, character. Gentlemen, do you want to add anything to what I've uh, said? Tim, you want to start and then I'll jump in and then move to the second wine afterwards? I think, by the way, uh, it's no, a beautiful most... expression of the varietal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, for those of you who uh, pivoted on Spain, as uh, Madeline mentioned, I wouldn't feel too worried about it. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a grape that is probably been in the Mingo Valley as long as it's been in Spain. I mean, it's one huge, very similar area. And I think that the, you know, in the past, it's been blended into white Wiener Verts. 
And now, of course, the, you know, some producers like this one are really starting to excel with Alvarino as a single variety. So, but uh, beautiful wine. Yeah. And then and can you, sorry, can you make, um, can you explain a little bit on the difference though between Spain and Portugal? Jessica has that question specifically. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I want to just echo what Tim said. Long before there was Spain and there was Portugal, there was Iberia. It was one peninsula. It was one right. place. Mm -hmm. And the grapes that are shared across the two countries are, are numerous, not just Alvarinha, Albarinha, but you have Mencia and Jaén, you have Aragonesh and, and Tinta, you know, Tinta Rorig. So you have a number of grapes that are shared across these regions. Albarinha, with a B coming from the Spanish side, uh, tends to be much more fruit dominant uh, and a lot more of that sort of stone fruit that uh, Madeline was alluding to before, even more exaggerated, in my opinion, with a stronger undercurrent of tropicalness there. The Alvarinhas, which come from the sort of rainier places that was alluded to, tend to be a little sharper, a little shriller uh, by personality. Um, and if anything, I, I was sort of curious that nobody picked um, Australian Semillon as a, uh, as a possibility there, because Aussie Semillons from the Hunter Valley oftentimes can share a, a commonality here, perhaps with a little bit more of that lanolin character that you associate mm -hmm. with Semillon, but nevertheless, a bit like Alvarinho or Alvarinho. And just to comment on the Riesling thing before, before I, I, I move over, is Alvarinho or Albarinho both literally translate la linguistically to the land of the Rhine. So there was thoughts for a long period of time that Riesling and Alvarinho could be the same grape. Obviously, that's since been disproven, but the name harkens back to a time where there was confusion across the, uh, the DNA of those grapes. And a lot of people thought it was Riesling in an Iberian uh, coat, but uh, nevertheless, that wasn't, wasn't the case. And Soalero, as uh, Madeline pointed out, is an absolute benchmark producer for this area, considered along with San Salmo Mendes is one of the two um, dynamite producers of the Alvarino grape in Northern Portugal. Um, and, and without further ado, I'm going to ask Evan to go into wine number two. And for those of you who are listening to all this going, ah, three master songs are talking at me. This is so much information. This is scary information. I just want to say that sometimes I come to these sessions myself and I can take two things out of here that I can remember. That is a job well done for me. So Evan, on to you. Sure. Just a couple of overview points before I hit the wine specific to give people an opportunity to look at what's on screen. Um, number one, if you do not have the wine in front of you, fear not. I, I, I liken this to, for those of you who are old enough to remember like me, What's My Line, which was a wonderful game show where people would give clues and you were to try and figure out what job they were. And uh, this is sort of like that. So if we give you the clues and talk about it, even if you don't have the wine in front of you, based on your theoretical knowledge and, and tasting experience, you might actually be able to, uh, to pick it up. So What's My Line, I believe, is going to make a comeback because all TV is old TV these days. All the game shows are old game shows. I used shows, to love so. it. Yeah. yeah, it was a great show. And the other thing I just wanted to point out with respect to the tasting notes is remember that these wines were tasted gridded by my compatriots and myself at a stagnant point in time. Wines evolve in the bottle. So what was singing to us on the day that we gridded it is what obviously we gridded and occasionally other flavors will emerge or come out. So if you're not following it and it's you know, lockstep to what's on the grid there, don't worry about it, don't stress out about it. Wines are like us, they say different things on different days. All right, so let's talk about the second wine. Um, as you look at it right off the bat, it's, it's a lighter color. It is indeed more of a straw color than Madeline's first wine. Always good to compare the wines back and forth since you have the ability to reference them. Um, and this wine shows a little bit more lightness, a little bit more of that classic uh, straw color, and just a hint of sort of a green uh, backdrop, a green sub note there. Green to me always equating to either cooler climate and or younger wine or both. No bubbles, no things floating around in it, and a wonderful star bright brilliance to it itself. Uh, this wine has an incredible pungency to it, very much different than the first wine we had in terms of the absolute aggressiveness of it. You've got all of those, those fruit things going on there. You've got, I love the, you know, the, the, the natures of the citrus, but the grapefruit in particular. And there it's not only the, um, the nature of the, the, the condition there, but also it's pithy as well as fruity in, in there. Um, you've got all sorts of tree fruit there. I would definitely pronounce that sort of gooseberry-ish character there, that sort of pungency that, that sticks out there along with the the sort of um, green peppery pyrazines we'll talk about in a minute. Fresh and again, a little bit on the sharp side. Some uh, underripe stone fruit, but nevertheless there. To, the, to me, it actually speaks more plummy today than it does part, probably peachy, a little bit of tropicality. And uh, yeah, there's that both sort of underripe green 
Crenshaw Mellon and a little bit, for those of you who spent um, any time in places that are a little bit more exotic and you know what tamarind tastes like, there is tamarind in this wine. And then that sort of strong florality, again, of citrus blossoms, perhaps other, other types of blossoms too, all of this being fresh and very, very bright and very pungent. So as we look across the other things, here's where you're, you know, whereas the first wine was so dominated by fruit, this wine has other stuff going on. And there are green elements to it, whether you call it celery root or celeriac, whether you call it leek greens, whether you call it cucumbers or that sort of green pepper or pyrazinic character people oftentimes talk, talk about. Definitely some, a little bit of tomato leaf, a little bit of radish, for sure, and perhaps even raw onions, uh, which I know sounds kind of odd, but if you've ever um, bit into a raw onion and you know there's both a sweet and sharpness to it, you get it there. Strong herbal notes here, and particularly the sorrel notes, the basil notes, and that cilantro note is there. Not a lot of other spices, not a lot of other uh, things. A little bit of mushroominess aside from the, the inorganic earth on the prior page, but this wine to me is defined a lot by its sort of, um, again, sort of seashell, saline, almost a brininess uh, to this wine that mm -hmm. is really um, pushing and highlighting the way salt exaggerates food flavor. The, the, the salinity here or that brininess is bringing the fruit flavor out in the wines. Um, no sense of oak whatsoever, nothing else really going on. Maybe a little bit of uh, least contact for texture, flavor, and all that. But I do think that the weight that we're getting here has more to do with the wine itself, as we'll learn shortly. It's dry. The acid is uh, shrill in that medium plus to high vein, depending on your personal barometer for those characteristics. The acid, uh, the alcohol levels are somewhere in that medium to medium plus range. No phenolics here uh, to speak of per se in terms of bitterness or tannins or grit. Uh, definitely leaner and tartar in uh, nature and with a very long finish. In fact, you know, if you do the three second delay, uh, it keeps coming back at you and a really nice complexity uh, to it. All right, so we have some choices here. If you're going through your glass on where you could be and what you could be. Um, four choices of uh, grapes. There's always the other. And for those people that have been playing with this uh, and playing with us for 10 months, I promise you one of these days, I'm gonna have an other choice too. So uh, I'll just make it up there. But Sauvignon Blanc as a blend, because oftentimes it's not a pure variety wine. Chardonnay, of course, is a classic variety. Verdejo, which a lot of you may be not so familiar with, but it's a great grape that again, we find particularly in Iberia and would associate it in uh, the case of Spain uh, with the Roeda area, some other grapes there. Uh, and then you've got your old world choices being France and Spain, your new world choices being Chile and New Zealand. I love that I get the benefit of seeing everybody's answers. They are anonymous. I, I, we didn't say that at the beginning. I wanna make sure that you guys know they are anonymous. So we don't know who picked what. And so this is a very safe space for you to throw it out there. And if you pick other, Tell us what else you were thinking of, um, and that would be really helpful. And just drop it into the chat and say, I was thinking it was this. Why is it not that? That would be really helpful. Um, Evan, for you, what are some things that you would lean on as a marker uh, to help you decide here? Well, I, I think right off the bat, the aggressiveness of this wine is in large part what defines its personality. Um, it doesn't have as much subtlety to it, certainly doesn't have as much subtlety to it as the first wine did. And it is that sort of, uh, again, sort of pungency, brusqueness, uh, in your face nature that, that helps define both the variety and the personality of the wine. Um, I would look at the underscoring sort of uh, greener notes that are more predominant in this wine than they were in the first wine as being also perhaps potential clues uh, to where it is. And then obviously, once you start thinking about your grape clues, that's when you start thinking about your regions, because it's really important for people to remember that, that a lot of this is grounded in your own knowledge and sense of this, because you'll know, oh, well, this grape doesn't grow there, or it's not as predominant here as it is there. And if I pick this grape, I should go to this region because I know a lot of it's there. So if some of this is a little bit confusing um, to you, again, over time with both tasting experience, staring at grocery shelves is a really great way to learn about wine. You learn about geographies and grape variety associations. And then simply reading, following your own personal curiosity online in books, et cetera, will reinforce and, and uh, validate a lot of your pairings of regions with grapes. And what Let's is see this wine? So let's talk about it. Um, this wine is in fact Sauvignon Blanc. It is in fact uh, from Chile. So those of you who are on the other side smiling now and giving yourselves a high five, brilliant job on you. It comes from a namesake region slash 
winery. So the, the winery is called Leda, Vina Leda. The area that it comes from is also called Leda, L-E-Y-D-A. And Leda is a new appellation uh, that sits in the larger appellation of San Antonio, which sits in the larger appellation of Aconcagua. And it is a pretty new area. It's only about 20 uh, years old. The first um, wines, grapes, I should say, were planted in 1998. The first wines were made about three years later. And um, the winemaker for Vigna Leda is an absolutely fabulous friend of mine by the name of Viviana Navarrete. It's my understanding Viviana is on this call and she should say hello. Thank you, Viviana, for joining us today and providing us with such incredible wines. She is uh, considered an absolute rock star in her namesake Chile and was named by my other good friend Tim Atkin as winemaker of the year for all of the country in his 2020 annual report. And those are some seriously major accolades on it. Um, what can I tell you about, about this? Within Chile, the wines that come from Leda, Sauvignon Blanc we're talking about here, tend to be a little bit more textured, a little bit richer and not just because of uh, Lee's contact, but they tend to be a bit oilier, fuller, more um, dry extract, if you will, as Tim would always say, than those coming from Casablanca, which is the most uh, uh, probably well-known appellation within the same greater Aconcagua area. Those wines tend to be citric, lean, fresh, and bright, uh, moving from sort of the lemon to the grapefruit as you move from west to east in that country, whereas those from Leda just have this wonderful combination of, of uh, yellow, as I said before, sort of yellow plums and uh, beautiful citrus flavors. They also have interesting floral notes, elderflowers, a little bit of that gooseberry thing, nettle uh, at time was very typical of a thing, but they don't have, so for those of you who are going, okay, Evan, why not New Zealand? New Zealand is gonna have a much more pyrazinic green pepper character than this wine does. This is a back note in this wine, and it's really more about that purity of fruit and the floral elements. And it's not going to have as much of that sort of, again, because the, the two vineyards that, uh, that Vigna Leda works from, that Viviana works from, one of them is literally less than, than five miles from the ocean. So it literally does carry over uh, that sort of saline spray, that sea spray into uh, the vineyards, which therefore translates a little bit into the grapes. If you picked up a brininess there, it is actual uh, happening. They also, the ones in France tend to be, as I little, said before, a little bit more lanoline-y, a little bit more wet wool. Um, those in New Zealand maybe a little bit, how should we say in the nice ways, a little cattier at times. Um, for those of you who have cats, I have too, we know what that smells like. Um, but there is sort of a brightness and a freshness here. And this is a dynamite example, not only of Chilean uh, Sauvignon Blanc, but I think it really, um, if you can lock and load, click that um, in your brain and hold it for what Leda Sauvignon Blanc and specifically talks about uh, in this glass, that's what this wine is. I wanted can to I pipe up, mm -hmm. Evan, just Please, for a moment and say if you're going back and forth, you know, uh, considering where it's from, to me, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, again, a generalization, will have a little bit of a sweeter um, expression to the aromatics and not quite as, um, you know, overtly green. And also, you know, quite often this has, this has um, distinct minerality and salinity, which I don't find in New Zealand that often. And um, I find those expressions a little bit simpler. Tim, would you agree with that? And I think Verdejo would be a perfectly respectable call for this wine because, you know, a little splash of, uh, of Sauvignon Blanc in that uh, Spanish white would do the trick. Yeah, absolutely. I also, I also would add that, you know, uh, the latest Sauvignon Blancs to me are very tropical. You know, the tamarind and papaya and calls were perfect. And if anything, I'm trying to put this delicately, you know, more often than not, the New Zealand wines, especially the ones that I produce in large quantities, are, for lack of a better word, they're reductive. So screw cap wines, you know, the thiols and thiol esters, if you want to get technical. So the descriptions like rubber hose and tennis balls and, and things like that. You know, I find that still in a lot of New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs and almost never in Chilean Sauvignon Blanc. All right, Tim, you're up for your first wine. Wine number three, everyone. Okay, hello everyone. Hope you're keeping warm. And uh, Andrea, if we can go to the first slide, please. There we are. So everybody, as we look at the wine, uh, definitely bright, it's clear. Uh, the color is definitely yellow as opposed to straw and uh, no bubbles. And then on the nose, and Madeline mentioned that we do the nose and the palate together. 
Okay, so this is interesting. You know, this is certainly not as aromatic as the first two wines. And by the way, if I can stop for a second, rewind a bit. Those of you who called Sauvignon Blanc in the first wine, now you have a really textbook example in the second wine, and so you can do an A-B comparison. Okay, moving ahead. This particular wine is a different universe, right? So it's not really overtly aromatic. So there's not a lot of green notes at all. What is present seems to be fruit, but also the hint of the stamp of winemaking. In terms of the fruit profile, certainly citrus and tree fruit growth kind of share uh, the stage here. Most of the citrus is somewhere between tart and semi-sweet. Uh, and looking at this list, I like lemon. I would add lime to that and tangerine. And so the sweet citrus here is to me the lifted, the very uh, tart type sweet citrus. The condition is fresh and ripe. And I would say for me, the peel and zest more than anything else. In terms of tree fruit, and of course that's the fancy term for apple and pear, which are probably present in 99% of the wines here. This is dominated by, you know, not green apple, but here for me, more red and yellow apple and also Asian pear. Once again, the condition is fresh and ripe. There's definitely some stone fruit here. I think it takes a, at least, a, you know, the back seat today. And by the way, Evan and Madeline, I want you to know, of course, I went on the biodynamic calendar and today is a root day, which means we should probably all go home, right? Just kidding. We're here. <laughs> We're trained professionals. We're going to work through it. Anyway, so there is some, I would say, white peach here, maybe some nectarine. Again, it's fresh. Everything in terms of the fruit condition is fresh. I do like the tropical fruit call. And here I'm getting pineapple and a little bit of banana. Once again, fresh. Floral, not nearly as floral as wine number one, the Alvarino, but there is a touch of citrus blossom here. And the reason is, is because there's other things, secondary type things that are really taking over the aromatics in terms of high tones. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide. <clears throat> so I mentioned previously, I don't think there's much in the way of herbs and vegetal. I do like, I'm gonna skip the first two lines going to the third. I do like the call in verbena and chamomile. I think those are both really good. There's some honey here. I'm thinking the honey here could be from some used oak. All right. I think there's a touch of mushroominess also, and a, a touch of chalk, but it's really, to me, it's important, but it doesn't dominate the wine. To me, the fruit dominates the wine. Uh, no animals <laughs> at all. I always crack up when I see that line. Oak aging, yes, but here predominantly used oak. There is very low toned uh, nuttiness. I like the almond and marzipan uh, call and also the hazelnut. In terms of chemical type compounds, there's a little bit of SO2 and that was really prominent when I first opened the little bottle and uh, you know, kind of a matchstick. There is a little bit of oxidation and to me that's from least contact but also from used oak. And I think the wine, there's a touch of a creamy buttery quality, which to me is reminiscent of malolactic, of course, that magical compound called diacetyl or diacetyl that smells like microwave popcorn, little goes a long way. So here, I guess what we're saying is once we get it past all the fruit, in terms of secondary, we've got a tiny bit of savory type herbs, touch of earth and mineral, but the winemaking stamp, we've got lees contact and we've got some uh, malolactic and definitely some used oak on the wine. Okay, on the palate, the structure, the wine is fermented dry. The acid to me is only medium plus, at least today. The alcohol, definitely medium plus, not high. Uh, phenols, none. And if you're confused about the phenols, again, Madeline did a great description of it. Skin contact, phenols, big family of chemical compounds. They, wait, they make the wine taste bitter, okay? Uh, extreme example would be Alsace uh, Gewürztraminer, which is incredibly bitter, right? Taste uh, the Alvarino again against this wine so you can get a wine number one with phenols and then wine number three, none whatsoever, okay? Uh, and what else? You know, you might, when we get done with this, taste the Sauvignon Blanc against wine number three because you know, the Sauvignon Blanc is probably stainless steel. I would be surprised if any wood is used. And this wine number three definitely has some used wood. Okay, the texture is rounded smooth. Definitely the finish is medium plus and the complexity is medium plus. 
Okay. Great. Thanks, Tim. How would you classify which of the things that we've just went through that would be benchmark for you to lean on for identification? Well, you know, to me, that's a great question, Lee Man. You know, it's, it's a question of what I call impact compounds, which are 25 to 30 aromatics and flavors that are usually from the grape. They could be environmental or they could be winemaking. And so over here, I'm leaning on basically least contact mal lactic and oak. That's a, a trinity of happy dwarves, if we want to call them that. <laughs> and uh, and there's plenty of others. You know, in, in uh, wine number two is a beautiful Sauvignon Blanc, and the pyrazines were very intense, but really laser-like and precise. And so for me, you know, I put my nose in the glass of wine number two, and it's Sauvignon Blanc, and that it's a question of where. And also in wine number three, the structure here, this is a beautifully restrained wine, you know? So I'm thinking here, you know, how, you know, the climate, climate here is very temperate. You know, I, we probably got 13% alcohol, uh, medium plus, but not high acid. And also there is hints of both earth and mineral, but is it enough to take me to the old world? And that's a question I will pose to you viewers out there. So everybody, out there in Cyberland, I want you to taste the Alvarino next to wine number three. Okay, mm, that's a really good AB comparison. And though we've said, yeah, there's earth and mineral, you know, in wine three, is it really enough to take you to the old world? And tasting wine one again may answer that question. Tim, okay. the first thing you said, the first thing you said uh, when you started describing the wine was this to you was about my wine making choices aromatically. Yes you know, yes. and also on the, on the palate. So I just want to uh, throw that out. If that occurs to you, uh, consider it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This is, Evan, to, to, to use your phrase, this is kind of like Jedi training. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Li Meng, why don't we go to the reveal, please? Great. And, and Tim, why, if you're going to go into old world, uh, new world, I guess the difference between Oregon and Argentina. This wine okay. here. Well, you know, again, and Evan can speak to this a lot better than I can. This is such a beautiful restrained style of Chardonnay. And this, of course, is from Pepe Galante, who to me is one of the Noah's without the Ark of Argentine wine. I mean, you know, I think, Evan, did we meet him in 2008? I know that's we, I, we I, I don't recall. Did we meet him then? We no, I don't. Did. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. Okay. I've had the I've had the privilege and honor of meeting him a couple of times, and I believe his yeah. uh, his somebody in his family is with us today too, which is great. Um, this is his yeah. pet project. You know, he's been so known for other people's wine, OPW, for so long. He was you know the head winemaker at Catena forever, and helped helped literally not only Catena but the entire Argentinian wine industry make that hard pivot into um, to, to seriousness. And this is his own pet project. And, and um, I, I wanted to show this wine just because, you know, I think for people who don't even have a, a conception that A, Argentina makes white wines, much less Chardonnay, you know, most of them associated purely with Torrentes. This is a serious wine of intent of, of uh, you know, strength, as you said before, of a very Burgundian approach toward, hence the matchstick and the, and the soft production on it. And, um, you know, just a, a real, in character fruit and not an overplayed hand on the oak and the, the ML and everything. And um, I, I think the, the question about it being like Oregon is a very interesting one because, you know, a lot of people never associate Oregon with Chardonnay and really associate it with Pinot Gris. And yet some of the most interesting white wines being made across Oregon today are in fact at Chardonnays, uh, which I was in a seminar last week and we tried just a mind numbing example from Walter Scott Winery. So, you know, I think it's wonderful to show people again, our, our sort of uh, subtext at Master of the World is educate you on wines that you might not even know about exist out there and all this. And I think this is such a hard left from the typical more, um, you know, big extracted, big oak, big alcohol styles of Chardonnay that used to dominate the Argentinian, um, you know, landscape and are increasingly less so today. This wine obviously comes from the Uco Valley, which has got more minerally soils and, and higher altitudes and brighter acids. But uh, yeah, I mean, Pepe Galante is another rock star. 
This is really exciting, Evan, because that minerality, if I was tasting it blind, I'd go, okay, where in France, yeah, you know, yeah. not Chablis, mm -hmm. Maconet, you know, Cote de Bon, what is it? But I mean, think about it. Nobody's talking about California with this wine no, because no. that, yeah. you know, that minerality is so distinct. Um, you know, it's, it's very neat to see what's going to happen with these wines in, um, in you know, five to 10 years. Yeah. All right. All right, let's go on. We have three wines in 30 minutes. Tim, your turn. Okay, all right. So I have to be an Ego Montoya. I'm gonna sum up. Lisa, <laughs> it's a great idea. I mentioned tasting wines in pairs. Yes, that's how you learn structure. That's how you learn impact compounds. So without promoting a product, I'm gonna recommend as your attorney that you get a core of them, all right? It's the best 200 bucks you could spend in terms of wine studies. And then you can put wines together next to each other, high alcohol, low alcohol, oak and no oak, mineral and no mineral. And you can taste them repeatedly because at some point, all you need to see is glaring examples of yes and no, and your brain puts it together really, really quickly. And you remember, okay? I think you'll be able to calibrate structure really easily that way. Okay, let's move on to wine number four. Hmm. So here we are, red wines. Uh, as we look at the glass, definitely bright. It is clear. The color depth is definitely medium and it is ruby red. The rim variation is a lighter ruby, almost pink. Yeah, not quite pink, I just say lighter ruby. And then no stained tears. And again, taking a look at the depth of the color in my you know database of red wines, I'm thinking thinner skin, red grape varieties, and if I can extrapolate, I'm going to go red fruit dominant, cooler climate, higher acid, less alcohol, more savory character. Let's see if all that comes true or I just hallucinated something. Okay. And then going on to the fruit, uh, dominated by red fruit. I like cranberry, sour cherry, red currant. And if I can go all geek on a second, for me, pomegranate and even rhubarb. So things that are red and sour. And again, we can kind of map ahead of what the cl climate was like where these grapes were grown. The, the condition is underripe and fresh. And to me, this wine is just starting to show some age and oxidation. So a little bit of drive like craisins that you give your kids for school. Uh, blue fruit, no. Black fruit, uh, it says black cherry for me, yeah, maybe a nod, a drive by, but not much more. The condition, if it's there, would again be fresh and ripe. Citrus fruit, I love the tangerine call. There's a little bit of what I call constant comet tea in this. So there's definitely red fruit and there's orange and there is spice and tea leaf, okay? Uh, peel and zest, good, no stone fruit, yes. And some really pretty floral top notes. For me, practically all rose petal. And, and again, that's one of the most appealing notes about this wine and very fresh. All right, next slide, please. Once beyond the fruit, there's a lot of savory non-fruit things going on. Uh, I like anise, I like mushrooms. Ah, there's the rhubarb, ginger. Uh, anything else about it? Tea leaf, bergamot, definitely very strong. Licorice, red. Uh, sarsaparilla, reminds me of candy as a kid. Uh, and then in terms of earth and uh, both organic and non-organic, there is definitely some mushroom quality to it and maybe some forest floor but it's not overt because to me, the red fruit really dominates the wine along with the savory qualities. Uh, there is some oak usage here. I think it's predominantly used. In fact, I'd be surprised if there's any new oak. And here it's more like almond. You have pistachio listed. I'd agree with that. No chemical compounds. Uh, partial whole cluster, possibly. Stem inclusion, yes, because to me, there's a little green hard uh, tannin in the mid palate when you taste it. All right, moving on to the structure. Residual sugar fermented dry, acid medium plus, alcohol medium plus, tannin medium, mm, very interesting there. The texture, even though it starts a little bit plush with all that fruit, finishes lean and tart, the finish is medium plus. To me, this wine on this day is long finish. Uh, Madeline mentioned this, I think in wine one, the quality of this wine, really, really high with a very long finish complexity is medium plus. All right, that's a lot to work with. Right. So I'm going to launch the poll and I'll give you guys um, a definite warning before I close it. Okay, well, you know, just a couple of comments, you know, uh, 
if you think back to wine number three in the Chardonnay, look, there were earth and mineral components, but to me, I was never convinced that it's enough to take me to in what would have been France. And, you know, many people called Pinot Noir and also Barbera and Gamay. If you were thinking old world, is this wine earthy enough to take you to the old world? Pause for effect, okay? Uh, it's certainly savory enough, but to me, it's not earthy or minerally enough at all, okay? Uh, and Gambe, you know, again, lack of carbonic, Barbera, lack of acidity, also something I mentioned, and who was it? I'm going to look over here. Robert, Robert mentioned Chianti, so Sangiovese. And I would just say, you know, for Italian grapes, to me, practically always have a lot of grape tannin in the front of the mouth, and the acid is high. It's bracing, and the wines are dry. Okay. Great. All right. Let's go to the answer. Yeah, and this is uh, brick and mortar from Anderson Valley, still in California, uh, in, uh, in a place called Manchester Ridge from uh, brick and mortar. And I think that, you know, Tim, maybe it's helpful because overwhelmingly we have about 60% almost went old world. Mm. Okay, you know what, I'm not going to answer that question because this, even though it's a teaching moment, will be answered by the end of the flight. Okay. And then we'll come back to it. Okay. Great. Great. I think, Sounds I think good. you know, experience will really answer that question. What I think the challenge here is, first of all, a shout out to Matt Iaconis and his wife Alexis. I mean, this is beautiful wine. Okay. This is Mendocino Ridge, technically. It's the vineyard is 2,000 feet. It's above the fog line. Consistently a very cool climate and not a great diurnal shift. But you know, like the Sauvignon Blanc a long growing season and more even but cool temperatures. So very slow even ripening of grapes. But again, red fruit dominant, very savory. And you know, 12 and a half percent alcohol. Hmm. That mm. to me is the challenge about this wine because on the structure, where do you take it? Because this is not certainly a California Pinot Noir you'd ever think about unless it's from a you know one of those producers who is really into restraint and picking early. So uh, Oregon is a good bet, for, but for me, Oregon Pinot Noir, by and large, with exceptions, would have more fruit, just as much savory and even some more earth, but you know, more fruit than this. What's the deal with the salinity, um, the savory character on this, Tim? Can you speak to that? Well, I think it's, I think once again, it's very cool climate and a very long growing season at an even mm -hmm. more even temperature. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. the diurnal ship is not huge, not at all. I, mm -hmm. For what I would add, just my, my own experience in this part of the world, and it yet yeah, is important to underscore that it is a different uh, appellation, if you will, than, than Anderson Valley, which would be further to the no. um, to the east, is mm -hmm. that there it's very cool. It is an elongated season. Um, the, and by intent, this wine is, I think, um, created in a more elegant style, in a more restrained mm -hmm. style. To me, one of the things that I look at is this combination of this sort of younger, savory red fruits, that sort of conifer uh, type character that you get, that sort of tiny, uh, you know, sort of just simple green thing that's there, echoed a little bit with the stems. And, but um, to me, you know, Barbera is is more brutal than this, and a Gamay is more in your face than this is. And yeah. this just shows the restraint that it's only true. of those three grapes, Pinot Noir can give you when when in the deft hands of, of somebody like Matt who makes just incredibly elegant yeah. site-specific wines. So um, shout out to them on just a delicious wine. I know which of the six bottles I'm keeping to have with my dinner a little bit later on. Um, <laughs> but but again, if you remember that, that, that um, to go back to what you were saying, Tim, this is not, uh, for all of you out there who are using this for Jedi Knight training, fabulous. But this is not just purely about Jedi Knight training, and this is to expose people to other areas and other appellations. And if you haven't spent much time out in the uh, the far west, um, so that you know, if it goes Sonoma Coast north, but even further west, that's where Man uh, Manchester Ridge and that's where Mendocino uh, uh, fog line vineyards are. Well, Evan, on to the last two wines, Evan and then Madeline. Yep. Let's talk about wine five. Um, clearly, right off the bat, when you look at it, um, it's different. Um, in, in appearance. It's obviously got more concentration of color 
and the color itself is a deeper color. Although you can still, you know, if you're holding it against a piece of paper and there's writing underneath it, like there is for me in front of me, you can still see through it reasonably. So it's not what I would call a super deep color, uh, nor is it what I would call, you know, opaque it at any level. It's just a nice solid, clear, medium ruby wine with a nice sort of faded ruby rim and a very low staining of the tears. If you roll your glass um, literally on the table across that white piece of paper, I see a very, very, very faint pink sheen across the area where that wine was. And to me, that's usually when you carry that up, it tears down, but it's almost as much of a, a soft uh, staining or sheet, sheeting of it than anything else. Um, in the nose, what's beautiful to me about this wine and carries through in the palate is it's a lovely kind of perfect combination of red and black fruit. You know, I'm getting the raspberry, I'm getting the plum, I'm getting the sour and red cherries. I'm getting a little bit of that strawberry, almost like fruit leather that you uh, give your kids a little bit of one when you want them to walk out of the room. I got, I got a webinar to do. Here, eat this fruit leather, right? Uh, a little bit ripe, definitely slightly jammier character, but not overdone, not not completely um, confected, although there is arguably a soft candied character to it. No real blue fruit to say, uh, speak of here, but there are some black fruit notes here and whether it's cherries or plums or, or even blackberries, um, you get a little bit. And again, in that same sort of really super ripe uh, character, urging on, on that, that kind of blackberry pie-ish kind of fruit. No citrus fruit, no stone fruit, and very strong florals. Um, lavender in particular really jumps out at me in this wine. And, and um, once you get to know parts of the world, lavender is strong in certain parts of the world, but a little bit of violets, a little bit of, of rose petals too, both in the fresh and dried uh, conditions. A little bit of potpourri-ish at the same time, fresh. Um, lovely floral things and a wonderful balance across red fruit, black fruit, and floral elements. Here though, you move into this sort of secondary tier of other flavors that are there. And you're getting some of that kind of green element, whether you call it sort of your mixed dark leafy greens you get at the store, a little bit of green olive meat, even caper berry, picking up on just a hair of minerality there. Um, beets for sure, uh, a little bit of brown mushroom, uh, black olives again, very signature to that area. And if you add up um, olives and and, and garrigue and all that other stuff, you get tapenade. And for those of you familiar with French tapenade, that olive spread that you uh, put on on your, your, your croutons or whatever, this definitely screams of it. A little bit of that thyme, kiss of tobacco leaf. And then a nice undercurrent of pepper, not predominant, not over overdoing it, but there is, whether you call it green peppercorns or white and black pepper, it's there. There's definitely a fennel licorice character. And again, a sort of turned dirt thing, bit of minerality, as I said before, a bit of salinity, as I said before, almost sort of a, a, a limey kind of character to it. The oak that's there um, is presumably neutral and older. Uh, I wouldn't put a lot on it and might blend it with either large vats or perhaps other vessels like uh, concrete or, or, or stainless just to, to punch it out because it's really not about the oak here. It's really more about the fruit character. A little bit of nuttiness, um, just a kiss of volatility, which is giving you that lifted acetic character in the back. Very soft, adds complexity. You can't have great burgundy without volatile acidity. And other wines, a little bit of volatile acidity is a added benefit. Some stem inclusion, maybe some partial whole clusters here. Um, a lot going on, very, very jam-packed wine in terms of its personality. And in the mouth, it is dry, but it is also very ripe. This is a wonderful teachable moment to show you that the difference between residual sugar and a ripe wine is how long it lingers. And this wine has a very sweet ripe attack, but then immediately goes dry for you. So if the wine was sweet, it would be lingering and would carry through and it would still taste sweet, almost like jam in your mouth, whereas this wine doesn't. The acid levels are medium plus with a push. It definitely has balance and architecture to it. Alcohol is a little bit warming. Um, certainly more if we were talking last time we talked about alcohol was, I believe, wine three with the Puda Moon Chardonnay. This wine's got a little bit more heft, girth, body in the mouth and warmth in my chest cavity. The tannins are present. Um, they're not what I would call super heavy, but they're definitely there, which is where it goes, that medium, medium plus thing. And because the tannins are present, it actually keeps me from calling it round and smooth to deferring to gritty and astringent because astringent, I'm still getting a drying mouth character to the wine along with its roundness in the middle palate. The wine's got some ser serious length on it and some just delicious flavor profile. So what are our choices here? Again, in the world of red wines, so many 
parts of the world today, you have blended wines. Um, and, you know, whereas the last wine was sort of a fairly pure mono, you know, mono variety sung with the uh, voice of one, this wine definitely speaks by the difference between the red fruits and the black fruits and difference of herbs and all the florals and all that does speak to it being a blended kind of wine. Um, you know, not as intense as a Rush concert, but perhaps a lot going on. So Cabernet Sauvignon with other grapes, Malbec with other grapes, Grenache with other grapes, and then other grapes. And then you've got your France, Spain, old world choices, and your Argentina, Australia, new world choices. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk? Let's, I, I think we should probably reveal in the interest of time, and then we can sure. talk more about why. Uh, Andrea, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, so this wine, this wine's a, a gem of a wine. It is a Coturon village, single geography from the town of Valrayas. Valrayas is one of the most northern of the 22 geographical areas in the Coturon that can put their name of their village um, right afterwards. It is a blend of 50% Syrah, 50% Grenache. So those people who called that saying, there's some Grenache here and there's some Syrah here, I'm getting a little bit of both. Well, you're both right. Um, it comes off of the highest part of Valrayas, so it sits at literally about 1,300 feet. It's one of the highest spots in all of the southern Rhone and coming off very unique soils uh, made at Clobelan by the very talented Stefan Vedo um, and just shows um, what it's all about. It's, it's certified organic. Um, it's just a delightful wine and, um, you know, half of you did pick Grenache blend, not purpley and not um, sweet fruited enough to be Argentinian Malbec, which is where most Malbec is today. They represent over 70% of the world's plantings, uh, not enough broad palate uh, differentiation to get in the Cabernet world. Um, and the France, Australia, I mean, I've had some Australian uh, Grenache Syrah and Morvedre GSM blends that would be would be in this vein, but but different different flavor profile simply because of the old world fruit, usually a little bit jammier and more fruit forward, more extraction of color. The color here also helps give this away. Grenache, remember, drops color. So it, it doesn't have, if we're pure Syrah, it would be a much darker color than that. And if it were an Aussie Grenache, Syrah would probably have more color still. Great. Awesome. All right, Madeline, I think it's your turn. And I'm going to my, I'm gonna unmute myself and I am powering through. So if I am less than, um, you know, loquaciously uh, poetic, everyone's going to forgive me because I have to make it through the swine. So we are looking at the color and I will remind us all the color matters. We're not phoning it in. Just turn the wine in your glass, turn it and look at the stain. I can't read through this. I don't even think if I had glasses, I could read through it. So there's a thought. There is um, significant extract of this wine and this is made from a thick skin grape variety. Um, the color is deep ruby um, and it lightens only at the very rim to a little bit of um, you know, purple tinged uh, or violet. So it's also telegraphing drum roll youth when you look at it. Um, aromatically and flavor wise, I actually have a big smiley face on my notes when I put my, <laughs> my nose in the glass because it is meeting me, you know, 150% of the way. I don't have to fight to get yeah. the aromatics on this wine. And when you do that, sometimes people work the wine too hard. They're swirling like crazy. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, snorting and the wine is simply sitting there going you don't have to work that hard i'm gonna you know meet you more than halfway and this wine is doing that in terms of fruit um red leads here though there's black too and i really like the red plum red currant red sour cherry um actually all speaking quite ripe to me but certainly not overripe and fresh um, blue fruit, I even think there's a little bit of blueberry in here. You know, I know that um, our notes aren't saying it, but at this tasting, it's speaking to that. Black fruit is right underneath the red fruit. Black cherry, that little tartness from, um, from cherry, blackberry, black plum, plum, again, ripe. Oh, and a just, just, you know, jump on down to that floral category because there it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's right underneath the fruit and right underneath the strong green element that we're going to talk about momentarily, but lavender and violets to me. And we're only mentioning fresh here, but I think it's a combination of fresh and dried and it makes the aromatics incredibly pretty on this wine. So going on to the next, um, the next uh, panel, there we go. There are our greens. Take your pick. 
uh, green peppers for me, for sure. Arugula, I love the jalapeno call, you know. Um, again, not annoying, not obnoxious, but distinctive. Uh, other vegetable, a little bit of beet, both, you know, the beet itself and beet root. It's, it's got an earthiness to it. Um, herbal, you know, I'm a Greek girl. Dried oregano's in there. A little bit of uh, laurel and bay leaf, for sure. Other spices, um, black licorice, yes. A little bit of peppercorn, a little bit of paprika. Um, more organic earth than inorganic to me. There's a dustiness to the smell of this wine that I really like, a little turn, dirt, clay. Um, and when we're talking about um, animal, you're going to look down to chemical compounds because they kind of march hand in hand here. There is a little Britannomyces in the swine, which you know uh, manifests to me as leather. Uh, however, it doesn't command my attention. It's an element that adds complexity. And I'm saying that because some people are so pathologically anti-Brett that the minute they think they smell it, you know, it turns them off. Tim's cracking up. Oak aging, yes, but again, it's an element. It's, um, it certainly doesn't pull your attention. Blended oak, defining it, it means it's not all new oak. You know, there's a little bit of uh, new oak in there. You know, it's, uh, it's showing through with sweet spices and a little bit of vanillin, but probably a lot of used oak and or larger barrels. Um, okay, structurally, I think this wine, by the way, is delicious, it's balanced, it's expressive, and it tastes the way it smells, and it finishes the same way, too. But even if I didn't know what it was, I'd be going, this is really good, I'd like to know who made it. Um, absolutely dry, acidity, medium plus, alcohol, medium plus, but it works in this wine. I can feel the alcohol, but it simply adds weight and heft to it. Uh, tannin. Medium plus, but pay attention to the quality of the tan. And this is drying. It's the most drying of the three reds we've had. Again, it doesn't shut the flavor down, but that can speak to the grape variety. And there it is, texture. Gritty, astringent, but gently gritty and astringent. It's not, uh, it's not mean. Uh, finish, yeah, medium plus to long. Complexity, medium plus to high, actually. Okay, Lee Mang, I powered through that. Yay. Good job. Good job. All right. We're going to launch the poll. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Cabernet Franc or a blend? Merlot or a blend? Tempranillo or a blend? And what's the takeaway on this wine and the previous wine? Asking yourself, is this a mono varietal <laughs> or a blend is not a stupid question to ask yourself. Because, you know, so there's some grape varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon that are the little elephant in the room. You know, they will, even if it's a blend, they're the loudest noise, but other grape varieties, you know, play well with the other children. Yeah, yeah. Um, Andrea, I'd like to ask you to maybe go to the last slide and we're sharing the results right now. Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, we have 70% of the folks going with Cabernet Franc. I love this wine. Mm -hmm. I love this label. I love yeah. everything about it. Interestingly, I think Tim, just a quick comment from you before we close up here. Well, this is kind of like Evan's description of, of the Chardonnay. From Argentina, you know, uh, you know, for me, you know, uh, just in terms of ten tendencies and numbers, I mean, Washington is a better call. And I have to tell you, I've not tasted many Cabernet Francs from Southern Oregon, and this is probably the best one, and it's a beautiful wine. So if you went to Washington, no gnashing of teeth and despairing. It's okay. <laughs> you know, what, and Tim, wouldn't you say, you know, why not French? Why not? Mm -hmm. Look at the color. How can that possibly be yep. Chinon or Bourgogne? You know, well, not only that, you know, yeah. that, you know, I, I think about the texture of Chinon and Bourgogne and, and the texture is hard. It's acidic and it is bone dry and chalky and stemmy and it's not Hello Kitty. This <laughs> is, is warm and fuzzy and sexy and delicious. This is really yeah, and, good wine. And just a shout out before we close it up, for those people who are not familiar with Leia's wine, she is considered to be sort of the, the uh, carrying the torch for, for specifically Loire Valley style wines up in Oregon. But I think her um, Cabernet Franc is, you know, is the cat's meow, uh, literally in that yeah. case to pick up on yours and the best example of that variety that I've had from the state. You can memorize this wine for Maybe. varietal expression. I mean, seriously, yes. you can. You know, you can keep this for the next couple of three days and go Cabernet Franc. I've been told that's what this is. Aged mostly in used French oak, by the way, and intense floral notes, perfume. This is Leia talking. And I've got to say, go to her website, 
that's her. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, uh, Andrea, if we could move on to the last slide. And I want to just give a shout out to my team who's working in the background. We've got <laughs> Andrea, we've got Courtney, and, you know, we have the team in the warehouse and the winery. Um, I will tell you guys, uh, again, Evelyn asked the question, how do you buy this wine? When you go to our site and you t are tasting that kit, we have a buy this wine uh, link there. It takes you to Wine Searcher because everybody lives in a different city. We decided we're not going to just go to like one particular store. You guys can definitely look for where to buy, buy this wine. We don't sell 750s. We only sell 187s. Or you can go to the Wineries website. Um, before I flick everybody's video back on, I want to just say thank you again. This is Master of the World. We appreciate you guys sharing the love and helping us grow. I can't believe that we are on kit number 12. So this is insane.